Fox News alert for you now. President Trump meeting with members of his cabinet at the White House on the heels of that highly criticized summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin just days ago in Helsinki. We will continue monitoring this for any developments coming out of that meeting, and we are going to bring you his remarks just as soon as we get them. In the meantime, this is Outnumbered. I'm Melissa Francis, and here today is Harris Faulkner, co-host of Fox and Friends First. What? Jillian yeah. Neely. Host of Kennedy on the Fox Business Network, Kennedy, and joining us on the couch for the first time, uh -oh. Democratic strategist and former chief speechwriter for Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch, and an advisor to Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, Jake Maccabee, is here, and he is wildly out. Yeah, <laughs> wildly. I mean, just out <laughs> yes. on every front. What you happened? Said you were so excited, though. You've done overtime a few times, but this is a different. This is a whole different thing. Well, we'll find out. Yeah. You, you should. You should <laughs> pacing back and forth for the last hour in the green room. I mean, the Sorry idea, to call you out. No, the idea that I might be able to sit still for an hour is bananas. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> oh, I hope you take your Adderall, honey. <laughs> there you go. All right. No, it's great to have Ooh, Yes, welcome. In an attempt to extinguish criticism from both sides of the political aisle, President Trump admitting that he misspoke on the subject of Russian election meddling during that summit with Vladimir Putin and reiterating his support for the U.S. intelligence community. Watch. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be Russia. And I have felt very strongly that while Russia's actions had no impact at all on the outcome of the election, let me be totally clear in saying that, and I've said this many times, I accept our intelligence community's conclusion that Russia's meddling in the 2016 election took place. But some lawmakers argue that that response is still not enough. Here is Democratic Congressman Joe Kennedy earlier today. Look, every politician misspeaks. Every person misspeaks. That's fine. Wooden versus wooden is a pretty big deal. The rest of the tenor of that news conference with Vladimir Putin, made you, there was no doubt about what he thought. His walk back yesterday, he walked back the walk back in the next sentence. He has... Um, <laughs> This is a horrible thing to say. The president of the United States has no credibility when it comes to this issue. But President Trump again defending himself on Twitter this morning, posting, quote, while the NATO meeting in Brussels was an acknowledged triumph with billions of dollars more being put up by member countries at a faster pace, the meeting with Russia may prove to be in the long run an even greater success. Many positive things will come out of that meeting. Jake, I will go to you first. Does this help at all in the slightest? <laughs> um, not really. And I want to walk it back. <laughs> I want to walk back his walk back just for a second, because I think that um, one of the things that we really have to pay attention to is that we keep calling it meddling. Um, but this was an attack on our democracy by a foreign adversary. I think we need to call it that. And the idea that the president of the United States would respond to that first by uh, praising the attacker and then denying the attack, then saying it was our own fault for being attacked in the first place is nuts. And, any, and, and by uh, changing one word in a press conference 24 hours later, it's just not enough. It's not enough, but does it help at all? I don't think so, because okay. as Congressman Kennedy said, he walked back his walk back in the very next sentence. He said, you know, I accept the conclusion of the intelligence community that was Russia, but it could have been other people. There are lots of people out there. Who's to say? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a problem. The reason it's not working is because we're still talking about it. And uh, it, it's still an entree for Democrats and Republicans in Congress uh, have been told to be very mindful about their response. The president is also in the middle of a cabinet meeting right now. We're going to see that. And we'll also see if there's further clarification there. Uh, I agree that Russia did meddle in the election. There's no question no about question. that. Uh, I also agree that there is some responsibility, not necessarily blame on the part of the United States, because we did didn't have the proper defensive crouch in regards to Russia and their potential hackery. Uh, that's one thing, and that did happen under the Obama administration. What I don't agree with in terms of what the president said is that's not in the past. That's still very much ongoing, mm -hmm. and I think our, our government, our federal government, has to have a much more measured response when we talk about how we're going to stop that from happening.
happening in the future. Yeah. I saw Vladimir's bizarre interview with Chris Wallace. Chris oh, Wallace right. asked him some great questions, right. and there's no reason uh, that he would tell the truth. There's About plenty anything. of reasons why <laughs> Russia would screw around in all of this, because other than gas, that's all they have. Look, right. I kind of think the bottom line, though, is people are going to be critical of President Trump regardless of what he says. Was it his best press conference? Perhaps not. I think a lot of people can make that argument, but he's not one who often comes back and says, look, I was wrong. I misspoke. So I think we need to take a look at this, step back a little bit and wait until we see what other information comes out about that two hour meeting that, by the way, we still don't know much about. So, so you know, uh, to that point, where should the American people be willing to see lawmakers go on the issue of getting notes from the White House on that two and a half hours? Uh, you know, then also wanting to hear from the interpreter. I mean, that that's such a, a, a precedent setting set of moves. And I know we're going to talk about it a little later. We were just talking about that cabinet meeting that was yeah. going on. We're starting to get some notes out. So far, uh, the meetings with NATO have been talked about by the president, calling those a tremendous success uh, at home. He's talking about a booming economy. Um, and with the meeting, he's saying specifically they plan to focus on the very important issue of workforce training. I don't see anything about the Russia situation right now um, with a news conference in his comments. But we're getting feedback and, and a, basically a, a transcript feed from that that meeting with the cabinet. So as we get them, I'll report. Can them. I add just one thing yes. very quickly? Um, the news cycle is so fast mm -hmm. and uh, this presidency is so intense that, you know, to the president's benefit, at least we're not talking about NATO and we're not talking about Theresa May and whether or not it was appropriate for the president to say that Boris Johnson would make a great PM someday. So uh, you just have to wonder what the next big thing is that will come along to eclipse this story. Yeah, no, that's a great point, Jake. But I will say, though, I mean, you, you are right. There is a lot moving all the time. But this also felt like a very important moment. For me, this felt my reaction to this was sort of similar to my reaction to Charlottesville, um, because it did feel like a an, that's a big thing to say. And it felt that way to me. This really was an alarming moment. And his reaction has been sort of similar to how he reacted to Charlottesville, where he praised the bad guys yeah. and then came back and said, well, I don't praise see, the bad guys. And then was, well, it's everybody. But but see, I think this is where, unfortunately, a lot of people on both sides lose credibility. Because when you react too far one way and start saying things like Leon Panetta saying they must have something on him. Mm -hmm. Now, now you've gone too far. Nancy and, Pelosi, and, you know, too. But on the other side, for Republicans, when you say, oh, this, this cures it all, you also lose credibility because it doesn't change the rest of the stance for the rest of the conference. So it's kind of like you want to warn both sides, sort of take a breath before you go to the extreme in your analysis of what happened and, here because you just undermine the whole rest of everything else you have to say. And, and to your point, and, and I'm curious what you have to say about this, Will Democrats capitalize on this so much to their own detriment? Like, yeah, right. they jump right. to the shark. Yeah, that's my point well, on this. Issue. I think that there are a lot of really important questions to be asked, and I think we're asking some of them, and we're mm -hmm. talking about figuring out what happened in the meeting that was behind closed doors as well, because we saw what happened in the meeting that wasn't, um, and that was pretty alarming. So, I mean, we'll see how this develops, but I do think, as you said, that there needs to be sort of some actionable oversight. I think that I think that's sort of the middle that we're talking about here. You know, rather than saying, you know, running around with our hair on fire versus, um, you know, saying let's not do anything at all, his comments, you know, fixed everything. I think we do need to figure out a way for... I think we're hearing a whole lot of let's not do anything at all. I mean, what, what we are well, hearing about, Republicans are talking about the sanctions that they're ready to move forward on with Russia. You know, there are some bipartisan efforts right now. I had the chair of the subcommittee on, on cyber on, a Democrat, who told me that they're working on legislation now to keep this from happening again. I mean, can we stop hyperventilating for just a second and breathe in the oxygen of what might make it better in November? Because that's, that's where we should point. be fo focused. Uh, they could do this again. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, and that's the best point. So what are we doing to prevent that? Yeah, right. that's a great point. We'll move forward with this part of it. The Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is set to testify before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee next week on the details of that Trump-Putin summit in Helsinki. Counselor to the President Kellyanne Conway signaled the White House is on board with the plan. Well, why shouldn't he go? In other words, sure, he can, he can share uh, the many different issues that... Putin and President Trump discussed together, and the president highlighted a number of them yesterday. Nuclear proliferation, humanitarian aid, uh, aid for Syria, which, with what is a humanitarian crisis. And it's this president, not his predecessors, this president, who expelled 60 or more Russian intelligence officials. It's this president's Treasury Department that keeps on 
putting sanctions on Russia. All of this comes as a group of Democratic law, uh, lawmakers are demanding answers about President Trump's conversation with the Russian leader behind closed doors. In a letter sent to President Trump yesterday, six top Democratic senators, including Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, wrote this, quote, We as a nation must now wonder exactly what you discussed and may have promised to President Putin. Congress and the American public have a right to know. We cannot afford to be blindsided or outmaneuvered, end quote. And now a growing group of Democrats calling for the American translator present during that private meeting to appear before Congress and divulge what was discussed. I brought this up a moment ago. We're going to go deeper. But first, let's hear from Senator Jean Shaheen this morning. It's clear that there's no transcript, yet the Russians seem to know what was said and what was um, agreed to. I think it's important for Congress to know that as well. And so if the president is not going to share that with us, then the interpreter is the one in the room who may have some of that information. All right, so I asked the question, and I'll re-ask it now that we're discussing this about precedents. Kennedy? It's very interesting because translators are actually protected in these areas because, you know, if, if a translator spills too much, they risk losing their job. And, you know, this is obviously a very important language to be able to translate. This is Marina Gross. Uh, she works for the State Department and, you know, she mm -hmm. obviously wants to protect her job. I always err on the side of transparency. I want to know what happened in that meeting. I don't just assume because I don't trust politicians and I certainly don't trust Russia mm. that it was all hunky dory and I would love a little bit more of a breakdown. I don't think we necessarily need that mm. from the translator. I'm not so Does distrustful. Does the public but need it or no. can you? Okay. I, no, I totally disagree because I think that that whole move is made to undermine the president and to say we don't trust you alone in another room. You know what? The people who elected him trust him. He deserves the opportunity to go in and do his job. And by the way, if you listen to the interview with Chris Wallace, you know that nothing President Putin ever says is the truth or right. has to do with the question he was asked. Or I mean, that was, to me, that gave you so much insight into everything that was going on because he could just spin and deflect and not answer. It makes you think there's no conversation with him that would make any headway at but, anywhere but ever. This is, but this is part of the concern, though, because, you know, President Trump came out of that meeting saying, oh, you know, President Putin had so many great ideas about how to deal with this Mueller probe and things like that. And that, I think, is is concerning. Now, whether bringing out the translator is the right way to find out what happened in that meeting, I think that's a worthwhile question to talk about. But I, I do think that, that plenty of people have reasonable concerns that when you send mm. President Trump into a meeting with Vladimir Putin and it comes out saying, boy, what a great meeting, this is not a normal but meeting. But he, well, he says that. that all the time. I mean, he either comes out and says, this is the best meeting ever, or I'm never... Was there sure. anything right. different yeah. after yeah. North yeah. Korea? Yeah. Wasn't that think, a great I meeting, too? I think it neutralizes that call for the translator I agree. to be we do need frog march before but Congress. Those, those specifics yeah. I'd personally like to hear from the president versus the translator. That's, I just think it would sound better coming from the president to tell us what's going on and what he thought, you know, happened well, in that meeting. And, tell us, you were in the room, what happened? And again, because the precedent has been set where presidents have these long conversations. I mean, look at Kennedy and Khrushchev, not this Kennedy, the president <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. Um, she could run, too, though. Oh. Don't get it twisted. Heck. But, it, but, you know, you look at the history. You look at President Obama, who was having, what was it, letters back and forth and phone calls with Ahmadinejad and some of the leadership in Iran. And then, oh, and behold, I want to know what about do we that have? Meeting too. We, we, had, we, we had like a deal of the century and some side deals we still don't know about. And I haven't seen any movement on, on the Hill to try to get the, the language of the that. side those, deals absolutely. into the bloodstream of the American people. But those were also conversations with multiple people involved. Those weren't conversations where the President of the United States said, I'm going to go into a meeting with this person. Well, some of those phone calls weren't States. necessarily with well, eight people with on the, the line. You but either with the phone the United States and said, or you don't. You can't just have it for the side that you hate. It's not that. I think that it's really important that when we deal with a big foe of the United States, particularly one who has attacked us, and particularly with like a Iran? president, particularly with a president who has been very friendly to that side, I think it's really important to have other people in the room. Like Iran? Especially when you have, though, especially when you have a president who says, I don't want anyone else in this room. It's okay, really important. But, that but be everybody there. who's met with the Russian president before this met alone, like this is how it's been done with the right. Russian presidents. You just only don't trust this one guy because you don't like him. I don't think that that's true at all. It and is true. Well, I'll give you just one example. And everybody was in the room and we still had to lean in and hear the whisper from Obama to Medvedev, which he said, and I want to quote him, I'll transmit that to Vladimir Putin. 
Okay, I mean, that was a public moment, but a private within a public moment, and we still had to lean it. What was that a whisper? Was that meant for us that he was going to make things quite different after his last election, the president? Sure, but this is also a different moment. We've just. I'll take a sure butt and move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We continue to await those remarks from the president. He's speaking on a host of issues in the cabinet meeting. We're getting some readouts from that right now. We'll bring it to you live on camera as soon as we get it. Meanwhile, House Republicans today looking to force Democrats to go on the record over where they stand on supporting ICE ahead of the midterm elections, a bill being brought to the House floor. So what to make of the showdown? And President Trump firing back at former CIA Director John Brennan, who called the president's response to the Putin summit, quote, treasonous. Did John Brennan cross a line? We'll debate it. You stay close. I think Brennan's a very bad guy, and if you look at it, a lot of things happened under his watch. I think he's a very bad person. President of the United States with his cabinet right now, and remarks we're expecting to bring you in total on camera. But for now, a couple things that have come out. So T Secretary of uh, State Pompeo is saying... On Helsinki, the summit that just happened, met with Foreign Minister Lavrov, the president's discussion with President Putin, set the conditions where we have overlapping space. Remember, the president talked about how they wanted to look for the things that they could get done together. Overall, a very positive set of meetings over the last 10 days. That from Pompeo, secretary inside the cabinet meeting. As the news breaks on this and we can bring it to you live on camera in its uh, entirety, we will. Stay close for that. Kennedy? And this Fox News alert, a new showdown over immigration enforcement. The House is expected to vote on a bill today supporting ICE. Top Republicans are looking to force vulnerable Democrats to vote on the issue ahead of the midterm elections. Originally, House leaders planned to bring a Democrat-sponsored bill to abolish ICE to the floor, but scrapped that after the bill's main sponsor said he'd vote against his own bill, calling the GOP's move a political stunt. Watch. You know, I've been doing this for 25 years. You often write a bill uh, to gain support so you can actually have these ideas become real someday. We have nine sponsors. That's a little a bit of work left to do. We've got some public education to do. And uh, that's why we put the bill out there to start that process. Uh, they have no intention of actually passing it. They were trying to do a gotcha. But we're not going to let them get away with that. The Republican leadership inside the Beltway thinks they're too cute by half. So cute. And over on the Senate side, Senator Marco Rubio today slamming Democrats over their push to abolish ICE. Watch. If you don't like the laws or our immigration laws, I think we have to have them. We're a sovereign nation. You can change the law, but they are law enforcers. They enforce the law that Congress has passed and that Congress has, has on the books. And it should do so in a responsible way. But abolishing ICE is a radical, dangerous and ridiculous idea. Radical, dangerous, and ridiculous. Jake McAbee, are you in favor of abolishing ICE? This is an issue that's kind of splitting your party right now. Um, to an extent, but I also think that it's, it's, I think the issue of how ICE deals with um, immigrants into this country is one that a lot of people have concerns about. I certainly have concerns um, about how ICE deals with immigrants into this country. We saw just yesterday that 71 children um, are stuck at the border, separated from their parents, and the Trump administration doesn't know where their parents are. And that is extraordinary. And, and I'm not saying this as a Democrat. Now, is that, is that a, wholly the fault of the government or do the parents share some responsibility there? For losing their children to the government? Look, these are people... No, who, for letting them come across the border illegally. It's not about letting them come. They came across with their children. Often they present themselves for asylum and, and then they just get separated. That's what the zero tolerance policy did. And that's sort of, the, that's sort of what's going on here. And, and it is... I mean, look... Wait, 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 wait. I've got to slow your roll on this for just a second because I want to try to understand... So we're all in agreement that we want the children to be treated well when they get into our country. Amen. We have detention centers set up. We've even seen the First Lady visit more than one of them, making sure that what we are saying as a country and what we are doing as a country are commensurate with one another, that they're equal. So I, I get what you're saying. But don't advocate this idea that uh, people are coming across our border. They're not being kidnapped, Jake. These people are coming across illegally, and they're bringing their children in tow. And they know that there alone. is... Yes. And, right. Some of them are unaccompanied but minors. I'm, but I'm not talking true. about the ones hold, that are being sent hold, alone. Hold on a second. But, but in total, these people are coming across with their families, and they know by now that the situation is such that it'll be difficult when they get here. There might be a 20-day waiting period before they can be put back together. I mean, these things are, are pretty well known. I would imagine, at least as they get close to the border. So I think it's wholly unfair to put it all on America. 
right? We, we have to be in this together. Kennedy's talking about the responsibility and, and, that individuals take as well. Individuals do have responsibility. And, you know, sometimes these bureaucracies absolutely fail. I Believe me, as a limited government fan, I have no problem scrapping entire institutions and bureaucracies. <laughs> we don't need the Commerce you. Department. If it's broken, However, no. what Democrats are saying is, let's get rid of it, and then we'll come up with something real neat. Well, right. That doesn't sound like a solution, Abolishing Jen. ICE is, is extreme, right? And it feels like right now, I could be completely wrong here, yep. it feels like some Democrats have gotten on board with this plan, mm -hmm. and now it's like you're almost too deep in to go back and change your mind. That's how it feels. So a, a couple of things. One is that many of the people who are coming across the border, they're not trying to sneak in. They're presenting themselves at the border and saying... And they're coming from horrible conditions. Absolutely. And saying, we we're, need asylum it's because total we're agreement terrified on. for but our lives you're and you're talking about is an immigration issue. You're talking about laws that, that need to be uh, recrafted and redrawn by legislators and not this phony baloney stunt legislation. So what do we put at the border in place of ICE? Because Chairman McCall told me yesterday of Texas that we're thwarting nearly a dozen terrorists coming across the border a day. But, uh, well, look, ICE All is right. a... Well, we, uh, have have much more to discuss, including President Trump <laughs> taking on John Brennan after the former CIA chief called his actions in Helsinki treasonous. Have the criticisms from Brennan and other critics gone too far? We will debate that. Plus, he didn't say President Trump, but it sure looked like former President Obama was taking shots at his successor during a speech overseas. What he said that is raising eyebrows. Who needs free speech as long as the economy is going good. The president's cabinet meeting has just wrapped up. And yes, he was asked about Helsinki, the summit with Vladimir Putin and Russia. So as we go inside the White House to uh, listen directly from the president, we will watch what he Thank says about Appreciate the questions it. on Russia. Is Russia still Thank targeting you. the U.S.? Is Russia still targeting the U.S., Mr. President? Thank Press, you very let's much. go. Make your way out. No, you don't want to be the case. Let's go. We're finished here. Senator Schumer said you would walk the back of the Press, let's go. Thank you very much, everybody. Make your way out. Can you just we're doing very well. Well. Let me tell you. We are doing very well, and we're doing very well, uh, probably as well as anybody has ever done with Russia. And there's been no president ever as tough as I have been on Russia. All you have to do is look at the numbers, look at what we've done, look at sanctions, look at ambassadors uh, not there, look, unfortunately, at what happened in Syria recently. Uh, and I think President Putin knows that better than anybody, certainly a lot better than the media. He understands it, and he's not happy about it. And he shouldn't be happy about it, because there's never been a president as tough on Russia as I have been. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so the president there talking about uh, his record with Russia as well as anybody has ever done with Russia. I love the superlatives. I mean, it's only worth talking <laughs> if you're going to talk in superlatives. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning, they said, "Is are they still meddling, it sounded like. Yeah, that was and the question. he said, no. He does not believe that Russia is still meddling. It's a, it's a well, speedy. he said no. I didn't he hear. Said he, no. All he said was no. no. So we don't know what he believes. But yeah. Sounds insane. It does sound insane. It could be that he believes we're stopping the meddling at this point. We are working really yeah, hard that's though, to make this sound reasonable. No, 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 no. I'm not working hard to make it sound reasonable because it doesn't sound remotely reasonable. No. And I'm not trying to say it sounds reasonable. It sounds insane. I'm only saying he could be saying that they're... We are now stopping it, but to deny that Russia is trying to meddle yeah. forever and has been forever would be totally insane. That wasn't yes. the question. I would say this because no, I, I want to. Yeah, I want to just reset where we were. So we were here perched for this cabinet meeting that the president was having, and we knew that a lot of topics had come up. Secretary of State Pompeo had talked about Helsinki just moments before. We brought everybody notes on that live. Mm -hmm. um, we were not there was pool there, but we were not privy to a live cabinet meeting. These were the questions and answers that were um, put just after everything ended, and we were allowed to turn our cameras on and, and show that to everybody. So. I I don't know that we caught in, in totality what the question was, but it did sound like the question had to do you believe Russia or is Russia still meddling? Is Russia still is meddling? Russia was still the meddling? Question. I'm spitballing here, so just work with me. I'm developing this thought as, as you guys are so talking and we're sitting office. here. But you know how many times over the course of the last year and a half we've heard the president say, I'm not going to let other countries know what I'm doing. I'm not going to tell you my plan. I'm not going to a tell lot. you everything, right? Yep. A lot. He says a lot. Do you think, again, just spitballing here, do you think that this perhaps 
could be part of his plan to maybe not let it no, might no, be I mean, part of his plan but lawmakers on capitol hill are putting together legislation agree. for sanctions against russia they're fully talking can about just, it can i just add something here and this is a suggestion because i think this would help clarify pretty much everything again erring on the side of transparency i think we have to employ the bachelorette rule which is you know when, <laughs> when you have the first runner-up on the bachelor she oftentimes gets her own season and you know we're a bunch of attractive wait singers. so who's the runner who's going to get a season what i haven't i haven't gotten that far in the oh, development gosh. yet I'm but i will greedy. say this you know how much fun it is when the president's in a room with people and there are cameras and it is unscripted and everyone's confused and the chaos oftentimes leads to something beautiful. Instead of wondering what President Trump and President Putin might have talked about, let's have another summit where they sit down, we open up the cameras, we see the whole thing, it's round <laughs> wow. two, and, and we get to see what so we're like really, You know what? You're not really whatever. kidding, and I know Kennedy no. well enough to know. No, I would like, and she not, made an analogy, but she's not joking. But, but no, I'm talking about these two wow, people. That's interesting. Let's find out what they really have Ooh. to say. Can I can I add this in real quickly? Isn't that kind of what we talked about what happened with North Korea? Kim Jong-un, bring him to the White House. Let's have round two. How do we know that there's not another round coming? That's interesting. It's a well, it's, in Manila. it's kind of to be determined right now. See I how it plays out. All right. In the meantime, President Trump firing back at former <laughs> CIA Director John Brennan after Brennan called his remarks on Russian meddling during a news conference with Putin treasonous. I think Brennan's a very bad guy, and if you look at it, a lot of things happened under his watch. I think he's a very bad person. Uh, I also think that when you watch Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, when you watch all of the things that have happened, and Com happened Comey, take a look at that, and McCabe, who's got some pretty big problems, I assume. Uh, you look at the deception, the lies. These are people that, in my opinion, are truly they're bad people, and they're being exposed for what they are. Obama's former spy chief explained his use of the word treasonous in an interview. Listen. When I use the term, this is nothing short of treasonous, I equate it to the betrayal of one's nation, basically aiding and abetting, giving comfort to an enemy. Mr. Trump had the opportunity to say clearly to the American people and to countries around the world and to Mr. Putin, do not do this again or there will be consequences. And he failed to meet even the minimum standards of that. So, Harris, I think uh -oh. that the, I know, well, <laughs> I, I, I think if you cut through all the political BS, the president is not great at talking about stuff. <laughs> Maybe you just look at his actions. I mean, well, we, I know you're a fan. he talks about it, he talks, then he tries to walk it back. I know you I mean, are a fan of actions over words. The, yeah. the, the challenge here is that we are a world of words right now. I mean, we are yoked on words, by words, social media. This is kind of where we live right now. So for the person who probably yields more information successfully in tweets than any of us ever will in a lifetime, I, I, think, I think he wants to be able to do both, you know? And he needs well, to be able to do both. And if we judge on the policy, wow, he then has more words to say, doesn't he? Because he's succeeding there. So maybe the question is the words that he chooses. I think, you know, if, if you take some of his missteps and, and you, you sort of set them aside without forgiving them and take the result of certain things on net, he's still doing well. I think what he did in Russia, it was wrong. Yeah. And I think it was bad. Yep. And I think it was dumb. Yes. <laughs> but those three things don't equal treason. Oh, oh. They, they just don't. And, and the problem is if you keep crying wolf and you right. say that everything is treason and everything's a high crime and misdemeanor, all you're going to do is cast Donald Trump as the victim, which Democrats don't want to do. His hmm. base loves it. And it's, it's not helping your I'll, I'll say to you, and, and Brennan is clearly on your side. And he is nuts. And he is mentally swirling down the drain. And I don't get it. Well, I would dispute that. But I will say, treason aside, <laughs> treason aside, though, I mean, I, I come from a communications background. And yeah. communications is a big part of policy. And, and it, it makes a big difference the way yeah, that you, you talk have about, to be able to do both. You have to be able to do both because they are interlinked. And we saw it. it we saw, for example, well, just he's last not night. going to. So what are you going to do? I mean, it's kind of it comes down but, to do you do you want to impeach him because he's really bad at standing out there and talking about stuff? I'm not talking do about want to go. I'm talking the about results? but I'm talking I mean, about okay. understanding him as a person and uh -huh. what he's doing. Like when he talks yesterday uh, about the changing culture in Europe because immigrants are coming in, which is just white nationalist rhetoric. 
That's bad stuff wow. and shouldn't happen. And you shouldn't have a president of the United States who talks that way. And it matters. It really does. And when you go that far, you undermine the rest of your point. I'm repeating yeah. his words. The political newcomer and young socialist who secured a stunning New York Democratic primary win over top Democrat Joe Crowley last month is getting slammed now by some lawmakers on the left. Why one former Democrat senator is throwing his support behind Crowley and how it could affect Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the upcoming midterms, that is our discussion ahead. Welcome back. New signs of a growing rift between moderate and progressive Democrats, former Democratic senator and one-time vice presidential hopeful Joe Lieberman urging New Yorkers to vote for Congressman Joe Crowley over Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the November midterms. The young socialist defeated the 10-term incumbent and fourth-ranking House Democrat in last month's primary. In a Wall Street Journal op-ed titled, Vote Joe Crowley for Working Families, Lieberman calls her platform more socialist than democratic and that her quote, and that her quote, her dreams of new federal spending would bankrupt the country or require very large tax increases, including on the working class. Her approach foresees government ownership of many private companies, which would decimate the economy and put millions out of work. Lieberman's comments come after Ocasio-Cortez raised eyebrows, describing Israel's presence in the West Bank as a quote, occupation. She later walked back that statement. Watch. You use the term the occupation of Palestine. Mm. What did oh. you mean by that? Oh, um, I think it, what I meant is like the, the settlements that are increasing in, in some of these areas and, and places where, um, where Palestinians are experiencing uh, difficulty in access to uh, their housing and homes. Do you think you can expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd also just, I, I am not the expert on geopolitics on this issue. Maybe don't talk about it so much. Uh, so, <laughs> I know everyone wants a new progressive star in the Democratic Party because the stars you got in the Democratic Party, they're not exactly new. Uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, they're getting on a little bit, but their ideas are still very popular with younger generations who's obvi who obviously never had to pay taxes. Uh, how much of a rift has she expanded within your party? I don't think she really has, honestly. I mean, the reaction to, I felt like the reaction from Republicans when... Joe uh, Lieberman, not a Republican. No, 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 I, I'm not, <laughs> no, the emphasis there is, is heavily on former Democratic senator. Um, Giving, a, giving Congressman Crowley a, a good boost of that old Joe-mentum. Um, but I think that when, uh, when Joe Crowley lost that primary, I think the reactions from Democrats and Republicans sort of at large were very different. I felt like Republicans were sort of saying this is a massive uh, breakup in the Democratic Party, and Democrats in general were sort of like, okay, um, there really wasn't this sort of uh, you know, hair pulling you, that people expected from the Democrats. Do you acknowledge how real the socialist movement is within your party? Do, do you, can, can you see that an offshoot, a legacy point, and Ocasio Cortez, having worked with Bernie Sanders, can you see the legacy that he has created within your party? Because it's real. Sure. I mean, I think that there is. I think that there is certainly a uh, big contingent of folks um, in the Democratic Party. What are you going to do about them in November? What are you going to do about them in 2020? Well, hopefully they'll vote Democrat. I mean, this is this is also. I, I think. I are, think are those, if you were a policies, socialist, would you vote Democrat? Those well, policies think, are. Yeah, Joe Lieberman is right, and that they're economically unsustainable. We're already spending way too much money. Uh, you've seen the economy grow in part because. Of of tax reductions. You cannot increase taxes and increase spending and do anything but bring the economy to a grinding halt, sending us into potentially another depression. And what do you think that does to the lowest income voters in this country? It kills them. It's deadly. I think that there are two different ideas of uh, of how economics in this country works, and, and I think there are plenty of liberal economists who say that, look, I'm not going to, um, you know, get into how socialism works and where it works and where it doesn't. But I will say that the it where is, it doesn't list is actually much longer than the where I, it does. But I will say I didn't know that there was a where it works but list. We're talking for about socialism. But we are talking gracious. about people who are in the Democratic Party and who are interested in being represented in the Democratic Party. Look, we're a big ten party, but we take on um, very clear ideas about okay, progressive wait, 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 politics. Can I, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. So are you worried that those people though won't vote in rebellion? Because I think, you know, like the the common I, I 
I hear what you're saying in the sense that every party has sort of this crisis of identity after they lose a presidential race and you're kind of looking for who's the, is it the more extreme version of the party or is it the more centrist and you don't know where it's going to sort of stick. Mm. But it's the idea that if there are, there is this group of socialists that is growing within the Democratic Party and I think that they would like to see the other Democrats lose and they may not go out and vote for a Republican, they'll just stay home and not vote. But I don't think that's necessarily true. And I, and I would say, okay. I would say that I think that it it makes sense that she's running, um, you know, in Queens and the Bronx instead of in some of these other districts. Now, I, I don't think that all Democrats um, are going to be, you know, the same as a Democrat from Queens and the Bronx. Just like I wouldn't I expect. Bring, all, I want to bring Jillian. Well, just, well, just like I, I wouldn't expect Jillian. all Republicans. I have a question though for you, mm -hmm. real quick. Do you think that this interview that she did was a wake-up call for the Democratic Party? Because a lot of people did get behind her. A lot of people did support her. And now you see she's the way that she answered or didn't answer some of those questions. And then you see some people starting to walk back a little bit. They're supporting of her. Do you think this is a wake-up call, meaning that the Democrats really need to figure out their identity? I, I, th I honestly think we're reading too much into one candidate's performance, just like I think Republicans wouldn't want to be tagged all as being... Well, the like, reason that you know, we, we look folks, at it microscopically, folks. in a microscopic way, I should say, is because she beat out a 10-term congressman. Mm. Yeah. And Crowley's name is still on the ballot and got upset about that and started tweeting about the fact that she thought he supported her. And he had to tweet back, well, I do. But yeah. I can't take my own name off the ballot. It's too late. Oh, mercy. <laughs> All right. Well, President Obama virtually making an art of slamming uh, the president, the current president, without saying his name. The latest criticisms from the former president and whether they are fair. We will debate that in moments. Former President Obama is throwing some serious shade at President Trump during a high-profile speech overseas. At least it appeared so. Obama, at an event marking Nelson Mandela's 100th birthday in South Africa, bemoaned the rise of populism and took some thinly veiled shots at his successor without mentioning him by name. Watch it. As you started seeing populist movements, which, by the way, are often cynically funded by right-wing billionaires, Look around. Strongman politics are ascendant, suddenly. Oftentimes are based not just on platforms of protectionism and closed borders, but also on barely hidden racial nationalism. Unfortunately, too much of politics today seems to reject the very concept of objective truth. People just make stuff up. White House Counselor Kellyanne Conway quickly fired back. He might as well have just uh, called everybody irredeemable and deplorable. Uh, I thought that was very unfortunate, and I do agree with him that lots of leaders lie and double down on those lies. Um, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. Kennedy, if you don't speak, you're going to explode. <laughs> no, it's, it's just incredible because populism is rooted in leftism. That's where it comes from. That's what Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are tapping into. So he's being a total hypocrite here when he talks about that. I understand pushing it back against a strong man. And when he talks about everyone's making stuff up, it's like, oh, you mean fake news? So he's essentially agreeing mm -hmm. with the president. He went after capitalism, called it, you know, he said unbridled, unregulated and unethical capitalism essentially has to be wiped off the planet from a guy who just made 60 million dollars off of a book deal we don't know how much from the Netflix deal capitalism is great he's a, a, a beneficiary of that it, it is it is incredibly hypocritical and it's just it's exactly what got President Trump elected I mean it's that sort of elitist attitude where you believe that there's sort of this ruling class that's allowed to go out and make a fortune President Obama and that everybody underneath is supposed to all share with everyone else and be you know one socialist society you know I've always believed he was a sincere socialist at the same time you know he talks about people doubling down on lies I immediately thought we all knew when you told the New York Times that every family's health insurance was going to go down by twelve hundred and fifty dollars per year every year forever I knew that at the time that that was a mathematical lie it was a lie and he doubled down on it again. How about again. when he said that the United States wasn't spying on Americans? And that's exactly what was happening. And that program got all fat and bloated. Can I, can I, can I make two please, points just please. before you know, we go off the deep end? I just want to make two points. One is that I think it's an unfortunate sort of uh, measure of the moment that when President Obama talks about um, 
praising truth and being against lies that we all sort of know, oh, he's talking about President Trump. But I will say, let's put Trump aside for a second and talk about uh, and talk about how that applies to the rest of the world, because it's true that there is this ascendant um, authoritarianism around the world, whether it's Putin or Erdogan or Duterte or in Venezuela or Poland or Hungary, and these are really concerning uh, administrations or regimes in all these different places. And I think that is why, for example, NATO is such an important organization. So what did Obama do about Erdogan? What did Obama do about our relationship with Turkey? What did Obama do about Venezuela? I agree with you. Both sides. He certainly, didn't, he problems. Problems. He certainly didn't do anything else. And you know what? Strategic patience is hot malarkey and and that attitude is why we're here not, and, and this presidency is a reaction I, to the last one I think one. there's plenty there's That's plenty there's plenty of reason to to say that we didn't do enough against some of these ascendant right-wing dictators but that is no reason then to embrace them now which is what Donald Trump has done Jillian, no he's actually uh, let's, let's get into the conversation the before we say skip. maybe I'm in the minority here I'm not sure but each party takes shots at one another, right? I mean, this is something that we've been used to for as long as this country has been in existence. But unless these words are powerful enough to affect me and create change in this country, I don't, I'm just, I, don't, cares? I don't get into a fight about it. All right, know? we care about you Good coming point. back. Stay close. <laughs> we earned a lot of VA 